Hey guys, um, I received a request from a student uh, after I posted a the first part of a Christmas present in two parts containing two essays that I wrote, uh, two 90 plus essays. Um, and this student wanted me to deconstruct so they could see where the structure was. So like the contention and and kind of just go through and point out where in the essay uh, are certain features that I talk about um, in various materials and, and blogs and such. Um, and it gave me an idea um, that perhaps it's time to switch from a theory-based uh, mode of uh, producing and disseminating materials to more of an application-based mode. Um, I think that after having written six books and uh, making all the videos that I've made, uh, I've fairly well articulated in purity uh, what I wanted to for those that uh, are able to go and use it. And many people have. Uh, we've had someone score 90, someone score 91, and 41% uh, of last sitting students uh, of the 90 plus community got above 78. Uh, but of course, that leaves a majority who didn't. Uh, so for those people, and I suppose for everyone, really, uh, I think it's it's time that we switch now to applications. So I think the first step in that is um, we'll, we'll go along with the suggestion. I'll pull up these two essays and I'll go through and talk to you about um, the various things that I did and why I did them and, and take care to point out for you which parts um, in these essays correspond to the various things that, that I'm commonly instructing students to do. So I'll share screen and we'll pull up these essays. Um, we were going to have Shabir with us, but alas, he is sick, so we don't. All right. So this is the first essay. This is going to be a pretty quick video, by the way, guys. Uh, I, if you wish, I'm happy to do longer analyses in the future. Uh, but I, I wanted to keep this kind of functional rather than conversational. So here's the first essay, Role of the Governments and ACES Set um, from the online task. It was marked uh, as the top banding by ASA. <coughs> and we'll, we'll skip past these quotes and just have a look here. So what we see here is not just the first line. I often tell people to, to uh, use a hook uh, to imagine what the marker might be doing when they mark your essay. And I don't think it's... Um, <coughs> uh, too enthusiastic to imagine that it's it's possible that it's seven o'clock at night. Maybe they don't want to be doing this. Uh, maybe they're not being paid an arm and a leg and, and probably most of the essays that they're sifting through uh, are of uh, maybe not the highest quality. Um, so I infer from that, that there is some strategic advantage to um, entertaining or a bit of showmanship uh, or just, I sometimes say zig when others zag. Um, which is to say, kind of go against the grain, do the opposite of what they're expecting to see. So their first impression of you is, huh, maybe something refreshing. So what I've done here, um, and the reason that I, I've done this and not in, inherently good or bad is because each of these quotes uh, uh, show various perspectives and they're, and they're articulating or characterizing government as either good or bad. Um, and, and I thought that um, this... Uh, these prompts required refocusing along more productive lines because it, it felt to me a simplistic uh, interpretation of really any situation to say something is good or bad. Now, the hook uh, goes from here to here. Contemporary Western government's not inherently good or bad. These are moral and judgmental designations. Um, so this is a bit of a psychometric point here. So this, yeah, the, while the hook does uh, kind of finish here I, I finish explaining my point here uh, the first line is unexpected uh, it, it serves the function of a hook to the degree that you don't expect me to kind of go in and go well actually no um, <clears throat> here this is a psychometric point um, I, i'm saying that that simply saying that anything is good or bad is simplistic and, and it's judgmental and, and indeed there are more complex things that feed into uh, the situations uh, that we see around us. Also, too, I'm, I'm sort of telegraphing an awareness of that, uh, strictly speaking, there are no good or bad. There are just situations which are inherently neutral and they are coloured um, due to our uh, varying ideas about what we want the world to look like, uh, which is why some things can be good for some people, bad for others. 
Uh, so I'm, now I'm collecting psychometric points. Uh, there are simply people who are aligned to the ideological intentions of representative democracy, even when it's contrary to their own interests, and there are people who are not. So again, showing a more nuanced and complex uh, appraisal of the situation. These people run governments and corrupt the idealistic blueprints of political ideologies. So in this, I'm telegraphing an awareness of that there is a difference between uh, the intentions of an ideology and its application. Um, there are no real democracies on Earth, or like, well, not a no pure democracy. Similarly, there are no pure um, communist states. Uh, there are attempts at um, the real issue or the heart of the issue with communism is it's beautiful ideologically and uh, impractical so far uh, in practice. And I'm just, I suppose, showing an awareness of that, uh, as we have seen with modern applications of communism. Cool. So that's the hook finished. I've made a point. I've gone against the grain. I've shown um, some <clears throat> psychometric uh, depth uh, and um, perhaps a bit of political knowledge uh, and depth to my insight or, or understanding of some of the things that underlie um, uh, or, or render context onto the prompts. Central to the debate of the role of government, minimal versus proactive, especially in contemporary Western democracies. So here I'm, I'm, I'm qualifying uh, what it is that I mean. Uh, there are many forms of government and I'm saying we're talking about governments in this context. Are proponents of classical, modern, and neoliberal theorists who have different ideas about the legitimacy and role of the government. The transition from minimal classic to proactive and back to minimal has, in many respects, occurred to proportion the exemplification of government representatives' willingness or unwillingness. Okay, so this isn't. I often say to people after the hook to go into an acknowledgement or, or instead of a hook, whatever, that the first thing is that we need to acknowledge the scope or the domain in which our argument or opinion is going to rest. So the contention is a single strong opinion that you have, uh, but you can't just it's, be like if I was in the street and came to you and said, yeah, he's no good. That does make sense. You need context. So this, uh, what this aims to get at is to, to uh, acknowledge the scope and breadth of the topics that we're going to be dealing with today. Um, so, you know, the overall topic of the themes were varying ideas on the role of the government. So I'm, I'm highlighting here central to the debate on the role of government um, and qualif qualifying. And then this is really outlining the scope um, that we're going to deal with. So I'm saying I, I can't talk about all ideas of the role of the government. That's impractical. I only have 800 words um, and half an hour. But what I can do perhaps is narrow in on uh, different uh, uh characterizations of uh, liberal theory. And so I'm kind of gone from the big topic, roles of the government. And now we're just dealing with differing, different ideas of uh, liberal theory in a contemporary Western context. Uh, this is now kind of um, focusing in even further because there are hundreds of books, thousands of books probably that have been written on differing ideas of liberal ideology. And again, I only have 800 words and 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm segmenting further down here. So not only are we now talking only about liberal theory, but I'm talking about the fact that the transition of an arc of liberal theory from classic to modern to neoliberalism has occurred um, as a result of or in proportion to their willingness to sacrifice their personal interests or people who run governments willingness to sacrifice their personal interests in the name of democracy. So now we're getting more specific note as well that this is uh, quite relevant because here I've began with a, um, a setup, I suppose, uh, saying that um, the willingness to sacrifice your own interests in the name of democracy is the degree to which an, ideolo an ideology or a political ideology can remain pure and uncorrupted by human intentions or corruption. So I'm, I'm kind of circling back to that here. And then this is my contention. So <clears throat> the contention for me always comes as the last line of the first paragraph or of the introduction. Note that I've, I've hooked your attention in the way that I described there, but note that the, the, the sequencing down I've started with a broad role of government, which addresses the prompts. Then I've gone, my focus on this is liberal ideology and the arc of liberal ideology. And the, the specific, even more specific focus is how um, the willingness to um, sacrifice your own interests, um, if you are a representative of government, is the degree to which uh, an ideology can uh, be pure. Uh, and so I I'm, I'm keep doing this because I'm trying to make a point that it's like an arrowhead or a spear. And, it, and that the point that it ends in is the single strong opinion that I have about the focus areas that I have articulated here. 
and here. And that single strong opinion is the behaviour of governments in Western democracies have shown that they require regulation if they are to remain reflective of the interests of constituents of these societies, lest the watchman on the hill become big brother. The watchman on the hill, I've used that uh, phrase because it is the um, <clears throat> arc or the quintessential um, uh, description of the ideal role of the government in classical liberal ideology. They say that there should be a minimised role of the government as do neoliberals, uh, and they say that the government should be just the watchman on the hill. So basically, they should only interfere to stop people interfering with my liberty or not me interfering with other people's liberty. So they're just the watchman. Uh, but of course, when it when it gets perverted, when, when their power becomes inflated, there's a risk of them becoming Big Brother, as famously characterised uh, by George Orwell in 1984. So there's a few things done here. You can see that I've um, gone against the grain. I've made a point that shows uh, psychometric uh, insight and awareness of the context in which the quotes arise. I've acknowledged the scope of the theme, what we're going to be dealing with, and I've, I've um, of uh, pieced it down or segmented it down to an even more specific focus area. And then I've given a single, strong, clear and unambiguous opinion that is going to be uh, proven to you or proven uh, plausible in the rest of the essay. Uh, and and of, of as an embellishment, put in an awareness or, or uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose of quotes or ideas that exist in literature and history uh, to try and give my writing um, a sense of existing in, um, uh, in in a rich tapestry of social and historical phenomenon uh, and literary phenomenon. So that's the introduction. I so I'm just going to put this here so I can highlight for you. So this was a hook. Um, oh, sorry, this was a hook. Uh, acknowledge. Oh, I need probably a different color, don't I? Am I going to be able to do this? Oh, it's not going to help you though, is it? All right, so I'm going to have to color code. So let's make this green and I'll call that um, the acknowledgement, acknowledgement of scope of theme. Um, focus area, area. Now, usually, by the way, I would have one or two focus areas. In this, I've, I've done an acknowledgement of the of the scope and then a more specific focus area, just because I, I think I felt I was running out of not running out of space, but I had this, an intuition for how uh, long an introduction should be. And I don't know specifically how many minutes I have for it. I was probably uh, pushing it to write another one, so um, I'll just put focus area one here, and then here is my contention. Contention. There you go. So that's, uh, that's the introduction. And I'll color code this yellow for you. There we are. All right, let's go to paragraph one. Put this here for you so you can see it in larger format. Um, all right. So uh, first I'll have a topic sentence. Uh, the topic sentence is going to work in tandem with topic sentence two to prove the contention. Uh, I, I hope when I pull them out, they actually do that. Uh, we'll see if I've, I've done my own thing correctly. But for now, let's have a look at this. The interventionist role and power of government, which is furnished, modern, furnished, I like that word. Um, the interventionist role of power of, yeah, sure. Which is furnished modern liberal political thinking in the West over the past century. So this is important. This is a qualification. I'm always very specific about when, where, and with respect to whom what I'm saying is true, because otherwise it would be like me saying that what I'm saying is true everywhere, which is almost certainly not the case unless I'm talking about something as fundamental as saying that all A's are A's and uh, something cannot be uh, a certain way and not that way at the same time. And I'm getting off track, but the point is it's best to qualify unless you're talking about a very foundational truth. Uh, it was predicated on a misplaced optimism about the goodness of these governments and their representatives. Okay, and I'm just curious, out of curiosity, I'm just going to copy, actually, I'll do this at the end. So I'm just going to color code this for you. This is a topic sentence. Now, there are a few things about the topic sentence I want to point out. One, um, <clears throat> here's one, which is P for point. And, uh, and that should be 10% roughly of the paragraph, ideally. Uh, 
Um, the topic sentence is a single strong point, same as the contention. And a good way to come up with a topic sentence is to say to yourself in your head, uh, the single um, the single thing or single point this argument or this paragraph is going to prove true to you that serves the contention is, you say that in your head and then you write it. So this forces you, one, to make a single point, two, to make it a strong point, three, uh, to have the paragraph prove it, and four, to make a point that serves the plausibility of your contention. Um, and that's what I came up with. So that's my topic sentence. Next, I'm going to go into an example. Um, classic liberalism believed in a negative role of the government. That is, it should be minimised to that of the watchman on the hill. Um, so I think I, I like that I have done that because... I, it was slight, not arrogant, but it was slightly, um, it was introducing a little bit possibly of not ambiguity, but kind of a lack of relatedness if they didn't know what the Watchman on the Hill was. They may be left wondering, why has he put that in apostrophes? Am I supposed to have known something that I don't? And that could set them up to feel stupid, which isn't a good idea. So I like that I've then gone back and, and I think, well, I think it's... Um, it's good that I, that I clarified it. So it, it wasn't, it was basically I'm closing off a thread so it wasn't left hanging and that frees up their mind to really be in the moment with me. Um, okay, including simply to ensure the expression of one's individual liberty is not imposed on another shop. Um, economically, the market was believed to reflect these more critical ideas rather bluntly expressed. Okay, so this is. I wouldn't say this is an evaluation of the prompt. I should probably look at which prompt I'm doing, by the way. Um, uh, we don't need to be going to school. I don't remember, to be honest. It's too long ago. It's like a year and a half ago. Um, but I would say that this would be the example. Yes, because this is setting up the further, um, the, the further point. This is going to be more of an evaluation. So <clears throat> although... We'll see. Let's just go with it. So I'm going to call this the example. The, the point that I was going to make is it, it's not always as um, example, which should be 20%. Um, it's not always as clear cut as I, I give a structure because you need to be able to do it that way. But then once you can, if in the moment, based on the particular kind of flow of what you're saying and, and the nature of things as they unfold, uh, it can sometimes be in your interest to depart from it, but you need to know how to do it in purity to be able to, to, to go from it. So in this essay, it, it may be the case that, that there aren't as discrete uh, things and, and is okay to depart from it if the departing from it is done in such a way that serves um, that serves you in representing yourself to the marker as someone that has the qualities that they're looking for. But if your departing from the structure takes away from that impression, which most of the time it does, it's possibly not a good idea to do. Um, I would suggest, given that uh, this was marked that by ASA, that, that any instance of my departing from that structure um, obviously ultimately served uh, me. All right, economically, the market was blue. So here, uh, um, I guess I'm showing uh, an awareness of um, <clears throat> ideas that that have contributed to characterizing the development of the Western world. Um, it, it's showing me as someone that is informed um, and the ability as well to to deal with it ideologically, economically, and then to sum it up succinctly using the words of a classic liberalist philosopher, the drunkard in the gutter exactly where he ought to be. Um, it shows me, I think, to a marker um, as someone whose opinion might be worth consideration. I'm not just having an opinion. I'm referencing it with, with considering it from various points and, and also with other people and esteemed thinkers, um, which I think gives some credibility to what I'm saying or, or perhaps some seriousness. Metacratic ideals imply winners and losers. Okay, so now I'm making a point. I'm not telling you facts about the world. Um, yeah, I know I have an opinion here, but here the, the nature of an example is that it's concrete. Um, a, a topic sentence will necessarily be abstract. Um, and, and, and to clarify what I mean by the difference between abstract and concrete, an abstract noun, or let's start with a concrete noun, uh, stethoscope, um, prayer beads, phone, mouse, shirt, Things you can touch, an abstract noun, uh, sexuality, uh, health, um, ideology, opinion, 
These are nouns, but they're abstract nouns. You can't touch them. Uh, abstract things can be harder to digest. Um, but topic sentence necessarily deal with an abstract idea or an opinion that you have um, with some complexity, but sometimes things that are abstract can be a bit ambiguous. So it helps to give an example to kind of ground what you're saying in, in reality and in, and in something that they can understand and, and it brings them to the same page and frees them up to then listen to your evaluation. Now, your evaluation is going to come from you. It's not an articulation of something you've witnessed in the world. Um, so let's see what I do. Meritocratic ideals such as fairness the market, however, imply winners and losers. So this is from me. The marker is looking for uh, things about you. They want to learn about you so they can mark you. And uh, it's clear that, that, well, it seems that this uh, is not a statement of fact or a quote that I remembered, but work that I'm doing kind of on the fly. Um, and that's why the evaluation is the, the heftiest bit. Ideally, it should be 60% uh, of the, the paragraph, but it's the bit that scores the most. <clears throat> um, implies winners and losers. Structural violence inevitably ensues as growing disparate socioeconomic situations obstruct various members of society to access competition in the market, for example, due to poor access to education. And this, I want to make a point here that most people would go uh, structural violence in blah, 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 to obstruct various members of society access to competition in the market. They wouldn't say how. It's, it's important to tie off all the threads and be very specific and pre precise about exactly what it is that you mean. Um, because a lot of people are deliberately imprecise and kind of give the impression that they know, but they don't. And they're deliberately being vague. Um, not doing that and specifically being precise, knowing what you're saying and saying just that shows that you're, you're, you're on it, you're on the ball. Um, okay, now this is... Uh, Less of a textbook example, and that's because this paragraph goes through history. It's showing the shift from classic to modern to neoliberalism. So it's kind of giving a chronology. For that reason, it departs from the typical point example evaluation link. So you see here, I'm now going into, I've kind of gone example and discussed it and made a point about that. Now I'm going to modern liberalism. So I'm stating... Uh, some facts about it. It operates some more utility. By the 20th century, Western governments were legitimized by modern liberal philosophy and implicitly there was a promise. So in a way, this is kind of like an extended example. I'm, I'm showing awareness of the history of how we got there, but along the way, I am, I am uh, showing some of the, an awareness of uh, some of the, the situations that are, arose kind of using my own um, calculation or uh, putting my own input into in, into the situations anyway let's move on modern liberalism so the shift from a negative to a positive role of the government and by the 20th century the western government's power was legitimized by modern liberal philosophy which is to say there was a, um, a swelling of the power of, of governments uh, and based on the esteem that they had uh, from their people uh Implicitly, there was a promise of procedural fairness and alignment to the ideals of representative democracy. So this is important. It's not just a history lesson here. I, I now am going into uh, an acknowledgement or, or the, an ability to observe what underlies the social and structural phenomenon around us. We all know there's government, but witnessing that that what 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 it rests on is the esteem of the public of perceptions of procedural fairness um, and the degree to which they are seen to um, align to what they're supposed to which is um, democratic ideals and and I suspect by my use of this word that I'm setting up I haven't read this as a long time but I, su I suspect I'm setting up a commentary on how um, governments, uh, the ideas of government's procedural fairness have been eroded by things like WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks Snowden, um, the way that police have treated uh, and indeed killed uh, black people in America, leading to the Black Lives Matter protests and such. Contemporarily, in particular, over the past 50 years, however, this has not transpired. Yes. Increasingly, Western people have a mistrust of their governments and question the legitimacy of the governments come to floor. For example, by the purchase Trump gained with the American voters with the drain this one motto. Indeed, it appears that voters are swinging back to a non-negative sentiment of the role of the government. 
So <clears throat> what this is here, this, this point here is, I can't really demarcate for you here um, point example evaluation. I'd say this has more of an evaluative, evalu uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mark this the evaluation 60% uh, because it's not just stating facts, it's showing an awareness of the things that led to the historical facts, the trends and the tensions that everything existed in. So uh, it is evaluating, given that the prompts are all about the role of the government and negative and positive roles of the government, and the fact that I'm talking about the ideas and the, and the features that underscore um, the legitimacy of the role of the government, uh, for example, uh, their willingness to, um, to align the ideals of representative democracy. And I'm also talking about how we uh, arrive at the trend of a negative perception of the government. So an erosion in the esteem uh, that we once had. Um, so it, it's evaluating the prompt to the degree that uh, evaluation is really, you do your own work on the prompt. You don't talk about what was given. You kind of start to look under um, some of the things or the reasons why um, uh, the reasons why the points and the prompts are the way they are. And the last point here is a, a link. So it should be 10%. Ideally, I'm just going to give it a random color here. Maybe this looks nice. Uh, this is a link, 10%. And the function of the link is to um, sum up what I want you to have taken away from that paragraph. Uh, it says succinctly the point of the paragraph. And what I wanted you to, to take away from this is that there seems to be a swing to a negative uh, sentiment of the role of the government. And this is also setting up uh, a segue to the next paragraph, which is about neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is a return to classic liberal ideas where there's no longer a belief in the esteem of the government and the goodness and the altruism of the government. Uh, we, we want to return to the watchman on the hill, stay out of our affairs, don't interfere with us. And that, that's uh, neoliberalism. So here <clears throat> you want to sum up your point you want to show ideally how it, um, how your point relates to the prompt. And if you can achieve a third function at the same time, segue to the next paragraph. This does all three. So I've summed up my point. That's what you're supposed to get here. I've linked it back to the contention. As you see, the contention is talking about how um, <clears throat> uh, there's an attenuation in the, uh, or the, the Western governments require regulation. Uh, lest the watchman on the hill become big brother. So it's more of a hint because I'm the, by the watchman on the hill becoming big brother, I'm talking really about the transition from classic liberalism to modern liberalism. Um, and, and I'm kind of hinting back at that, or at least showing that this point is relative, uh, irrelevant to this. And of course, they're going forward to neoliberalism. All right, so again, we're going to have a topic sentence. The, the structure is going to be exactly the same, and I'm going to use the same colors as well. This will be a um, topic sentence, uh, TS. Two. And as a matter of interest, I'm just curious to see what happens if I do this. Topic sentence two, topic sentence one, one, two, and then contention. Therefore, contention. Let's see if this makes sense. The interventionist role of the power of the government, which has furnished modern liberal political thinking in the West over the past century, was predicated on a misplaced optimism about the goodness of these governments. Sure. Now, liberal philosophy, philosophy <clears throat> which espouses a minimised role of the state uh, in individual and economic affairs, has gained purchase in proportion to the declining optimism of the good intention of the state over the last 50 years in the West. Perfect. They relate to each other nicely. And do they prove the contention? Therefore, today, the behaviour of governments in Western democracies have shown that they require regulation if they are to remain reflective of the interests of the constituents of the society, lest the watchman on the hill become big brother. Yes, that is a coherent argument, which is to say, if this point is true, and this point is true, they logically imply this. Now, it's not perfect, rigorous logic. There's holes that you could pick, but more or less, this plus this equals this. So you can see that <clears throat> the, the only purpose for this paragraph here, this whole everything here, does nothing more than prove to you the plausibility of this point here. If we were in some world where I couldn't possibly lie, there would there need be no paragraphs. There would just be topic sentences and contention. And you would see the line of my logic and you'd believe everything I said was true. As it stands, that isn't the way the world is. I need to present you a plausible case for my topic sentence. By the end of this paragraph, I have given you a satisfactory case for this. You will see that by the end of this paragraph, I too will have presented a satisfactory case for this. And if um, 
you are satisfied of this and you're satisfied of this, my conclusion will state to you that you must therefore be satisfied of the plausibility and the validity of my contention. So you can see that there is uh, an internal uh, logical structure. Nevertheless, let's continue. Um, so here is topic sentence. Let's go here. This will be an example the divisiveness of contemporary American. Okay, so I suspect that this is going to be a more traditional paragraph here. The divisiveness of the contemporary American political life from series, many respects furnished by increasingly visual displays of the exercising of state powers. Perfect. Um, that is an example. And I think I might go on here more the esteem of the police. No. So this is just a, a classic example. Example. What color did I use? Purple. Cool. Bit of a short example there, but nevertheless, this is an evaluation. It's an evaluation because it's uh, the example of, of given is the visual displays of the exercising of state power on individuals. What I'm hinting at is uh, the outfitting of military surplus to the police, which was used in the Black Lives Matter protests. So you had what looked like um, <clears throat> uh, the army basically coming through white neighbourhoods, which was quite threatening to those people. And the first time that they uh, perhaps felt um, that they weren't being kept safe by the police, which is one of the, the predicates of the legitimacy and credibility of the police is, is engendering feelings of safety in the community. Um, you might be wondering where I got this, as I keep suggesting, and people keep not listening, the minefield. I just, all these ideas, I'm not like literally everything, almost everything, sorry, this classic, um, this bit was actually from a subject I did on political ideologies, to be fair. But a lot of what I say in my essays just comes from stuff I heard in the minefield. Um, this was in the podcast about the um, abolishment of the, um, the abolishment, the, uh, can't find the word, disassembly of the Min Minneapolis or Minnesota Police Department uh, following the Black, Black Lives Matter protest. And they did a, did a thing on it. And, and I learned from that that, um, I'll learn this point here basically. The esteem of the police is predicated on the perceptions of procedural fairness and the need for feelings of safety that they are in intended to generate. Sure. When the police, however, begin to make citizens feel unsafe and the perception of fairness is eroded, the legitimacy of the agencies they represent, governments, is questioned. Cool. So this is an evaluation because it's, you didn't give it to me. It wasn't in the prompts. I am... I, I, I couldn't, I mean, the marker thinks I couldn't possibly have remembered something as, as direct to the prompt. Um, so it seems like I'm actually just investigating, going deep into things, or, or I'm someone that's able to bear witness to the things that underlie um, the various um, features of the world we live in. As it happens, I just remembered this from a podcast. Um, but that's what distinguishes it from an example, because the example is just a thing that happened, whereas the evaluation is my commentary on a thing that happened. Um, this creates an atmosphere for the divestment of the implicit authorization of the government's power in these societies by their voters. <clears throat> the divestment of the implicit authorization of the government's power. That I didn't get. I actually just worded that quite well. Uh, this word divestment, though, I got should, should be a. Um, so what I'm saying basically is that when you start to have, when, when their perceptions of procedural fairness and when the police are going and doing things like that, the police are representatives of the government. It contributes to an erosion in trust in the government and in kind of big government agencies. Uh, and, and that means that, uh, or, or it, it leads to that, um, the vote that we, that we give uh, uh, might not represent the same authority of you governing me as it once did as a result of um, uh, your actions and, and how they have eroded my trust in you if you are a government. Growing frequency of murders, blah, blah, blah. Uh, was hugely corrosive, sure. This might seem to you like an, another example because I've, I'm talking about something in, that corresponds to physical reality, but it's more just me continu continuing my point and painting a picture of how this situation came to be. Furthermore, and visual displays of this in response to these protests made the lack of safety felt by these communities apparent to the broader American public. These examples in combination with political sentiments such as drain the swamp during and after the 2006 Trump election signify a growing mistrust in the authority and goodness of governments. Again, this might seem like I'm giving another example, but I'm just saying it on the way to my point. It doesn't detract, like, I'm not giving an example that is big enough that it's, it's, it's redirecting the momentum of my point. My, my momentum is gathering towards a point and I'm just embellishing certain things on the way. So it's as much as yes, strictly speaking, I'm giving more information. It's not in a way that's detracting from my point. I'm just kind of saying it along the way. 
um, to show you that I know another thing. Um, signify a growing mistrust in the, in the goodness of government. So this is the essential point um, that I've made here that I've now proven I'm kind of circling back to. The optimism in the role of the government that liberalism is predicated on is diminishing. I'm just restating it here. Neoliberal. Okay, increasingly voters in these societies. If they... So this is the evaluation. Um, is that green, is it? Green, evaluation. Evaluation. And I suppose this will be a link. Increasingly voters in these societies are feeling this necessity. Yes. Okay, so notice here how I have um, summarized where I wanted you to get to, but notice that um, the necessity for regulation of the government, notice this, which is here, require regulation. So I am linking what I've said. I'm showing you exactly, explicitly how this relates to my uh, contention. I'm reminding you constantly of the relevance of what I'm saying in case you didn't make the connection yourself. This is a link. And proportions, notice as well, are, are, are about there, 10%. Um, the proportion should be 10% for the point, 20% for the example. I've kind of, that's a little skinny there, um, but evaluating. And, and by evaluate, by the way, just to be clear, it's to evaluate your point in the context of your example um, to address in a way that addresses the prompt directly is, is probably the, the full phrase that evaluate is short for. Um, okay, and then lastly, um, we'll come into our conclusion and I just want you to notice or, or take note again that, that coming into the conclusion, I have set up perfectly my ability to conclude strongly because I've made a point and proven it to you. I've made another point and proven it to you. I've shown you how both relate to the contention and underlying, even though no one's ever going to see it in this form, the fact that they do read in this form, which is quite deliberate, by the way, because I planned the essay like that, um, has the essay be directed. It's like almost that there is a string leading from premise to premise to contention. And I don't know if you ever, when you're a kid, you beaded string or you got pasta and you had like, you made a necklace for your mum, whatever. The, the point is that because there is a logical structure, premise, premise, proving a contention and that, that it is linear and that they do relate to each other linearly. It's like, I'm just threading my points on that bead such that at the end, it's, there's a very clear line, everything's, and all the decisions that I make in the essay are focused in a direction. Um, which gives it a sense of um, unity and harmony, uh, sorry, and harmony and uh, purpose and deliberateness uh, and power ultimately. So coming to the conclusion, I imagine I'm probably just going to be like, well, if one and two, then obviously contention. But we'll see. Uh, increasingly, citizens of democracies are okay. So this is. Um, Strictly, this isn't a part of a formula or a structure. This is actually just a, um, <laughs> it's from a, a quote by, I've forgotten. It's a great quote though. I wonder if I just copy this in Google, what we get. Um, no, not, not uh, surveilled upon, inspected, checked, measured. No, okay. I'm not finding it. Maybe I'll, uh, in the group or something. It says something like, you know, it's devoured upon, spied upon, inspected, checked, measured, beaten. Um, it just gives like about 50 uh, different <clears throat> adjectives for the nature of government and, and what it does. Uh, so this is more just, I don't know, it, it was aesthetically nice. This is ideologically justified by a tacit agreement of the legitimacy of the state, apparently at birth. Um, what I'm getting, okay, this is, uh, again, not, not part of a formula. Um, I'm just giving additional detail. Where that's coming from is, uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if it's from J.S. Mills on Liberty. It might be. He was one of the kind of the, the forefathers of, of liberty, uh, liberalism, sorry. Um, but basically they say that there's a tacit, tacit means, um, implied 
uh, soft, not direct agreement. So we're born basically, as I'm born, I agree to give the government certain power over me. Uh, the problem that an anarchist might have, and, and anarchy is a legitimate political ideology, I'm not using that word to say like a, a chaotic person or someone with a mohawk. Anarchy just says it's a political ideology which emphasizes um, uh, the fact that there, that there can be no tacit agreement. I didn't agree that you have the power to fine me for speeding or, or, or um, restrict my movement or whatever it might be. Um, so I'm just, I guess, showing an awareness of the underpinnings of, of how these things happen. Um, while the power to elect our leaders remains in our hands, however, these leaders are accountable to us. Sure. While the rise of populism has partly risen out of a distrust of politicians in America, it's going to be of this distrust. Um, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I, th I think what I'm getting at is I'm trying to bring, um, I like in the conclusion to bring uh, my points uh, uh, to a place where they're relevant to kind of contemporary affairs. It's not just I've said an abstract thing that has no focus or purpose. I'm trying to um, genuinely get the marker to a place and, and make a point that is actually insightful in a way that is genuinely useful to them or to society. Um, <clears throat> anyway, these views are framed and limited by one set of thoughts and experiences. Naturally, others will diverge. Um, okay, usually I haven't done it here. Usually I would, I would in some way you know, uh, address the point that I arrived at in paragraph one and then two and be like, well, it logically follows um, that I have, a, uh, I have a case for my contention. In this case, I didn't. And I guess that's just what I mentioned before, a departure from what I normally would have done because I thought it served my interests. And, and in this case, I, I think it does read quite nicely uh, because it makes it relevant to contemporary affairs. <clears throat> These views are framed and limited. So here, this is like a lot of people copy this um, and, and it's, and it's problematic. It sticks out like a sore, sore thumb because it, the, the point of this is to try and telegraph uh, an awareness of the, what I'm saying is an absolutely true. It's, it's one opinion. And, and it's easy to copy that statement, but it's, I, I have an aware, a genuine awareness and a sensitivity to the limits of my ability to, to, to make observations that are absolutely true about the world. And so when I speak and write, you, you'll notice even as I speak, if you, if you went now listening to that, if you go back, I bet if you listen to me say whatever it is I've said now, I'm cautious at times the way I use words and I don't overstep. Um, and, and, and that sentiment is expressing itself through these words. But if you use these words without that sentiment in your writing, without a genuine acknowledgement and awareness of um, those limitations, it, it, it can come across really weird because you don't have the awareness and then you just say you do. And it, it, it's a bit odd, but... Um, it's a psychometric point. I'm trying to uh, get some um, some points here for. Uh, I think it's a higher order thing to be able to do to to show an awareness of that because most people talk in such a way that that um, that they are absolutely correct and everyone else is wrong. And, and I think that doesn't bode well for a doctor. For example, if you have a Jehovah's Witness come and they don't take blood transfusions, and uh, there might be a time if you're a doctor where you need to. Watch a mother of young children die because she didn't want a blood transfusion and you're going to have to be empathetic in that situation. Um, anyway, onwards. Uh, we need not, however, agree uh, on all things to make progress. What I'm doing here is to point out that there are others um, that think differently, um, but I, I want to show, I think it, it bodes well for a doctor to be able to uh, unite people and with different viewpoints um, in a direction that is productive uh, for humanity at large. So I am questioning, I would have questioned myself. I wonder what the intersection between people who have different opinions on this um, issue might be and where their interests might overlap. Um, let's see what I came up with. If we simply agree, however infrequently it transpires, government should ideologically aim to be truly representative of the community's interests. Sure, okay. So I'm saying that regardless of whether you completely agree or disagree with my point, um, if you agree that government should uh, be uh, aim to be representative of their constituent interests, which I think no matter whether you agree or disagree, pretty much everyone would agree that that is what government should do. Um, then there needs to be regulation. If you believe that they're, they're currently not um, uh, fully representative of their con constituents' interests, uh, and regulation notice is my contention. So I I'm making a point for my contention. I'm kind of, I guess, addressing the opposite, but I don't go, it's not like here's the rebuttal paragraph um it's 
it's more trying to show how even if you have a different point of view, you, there may still be uh, overlapping interests with my suggestion or contention. Um, sure, I think this could have been done better, but anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I'm saying that that here we should regulate if they're not a represent if governments aren't representative of our interests, and then making the point that the governments aren't representative of our interests, implying therefore we should regulate, which is my contention. Uh, I, I think this is probably a time pressure thing. I, I didn't um, the, the cadence or just the delivery is a bit odd, but the double plus is a, a word uh, from the language new speak from Orwell's 1984. Um, which is kind of all about uh, the extreme uh, example of a government encroaching on their citizens' liberties to the point where they are now restricting speech and thought. Um, I think it's good that I, I put here, or I'll envision the state to kind of give some context to that if you didn't know the word double plus, but um, it's pretty good. He came to it. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> Maybe I just think that because it's mine, but. Um, this relies a bit on you having read Big Brother, I guess, but I think it's reasonable to assume that a Mark is going to be an arts major and a boomer probably. And I would suggest that the vast majority of that crowd would have had to have studied Big Brother. Um, so I think it's fair to, that that particular book would be assumed knowledge. This is the um, very similar to the last lines of um, 1984. Uh, there's like the only guy who's a revolutionary and they tortured him and basically they made him love Big Brother and the book ends with he loved Big Brother, which is like, <gasps> because he was the one chance at, at hating Big Brother and making a change and in the end he loved him. Um, so I said he came to love Big Brother. Um, it, it gives a sense of closure, finality. It kind of brings, it's like that last, you know, uh, uh, at the end of a classical, a piece of classical music, it resolves to the root note and everyone knows to clap. You know, this is giving a sense of um, of closure of, of uh, it being finished. I'm also linking back Big Brother here. I'm Big Brother here. Um, I'm using the last words of Big Brother, which to anyone that knows would signal this is the end, but also that I knew that that was the end and that this is at the end of my essay is kind of just a stylistic flourish. Um, but here is the jarring, but at what cost? Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, which I suppose is the implied, you know, when you come to love Big Brother, when, when, you, um, when you don't question and regulate governments, what can happen is what Orwell envisioned. It can become the point where the smallest idea of resistance is stamped out and you just um, uh, get brainwashed to love the government. Such is the lack of power that you have. So I, I guess I'm getting it that we have a chance prior to something like that happening to, to address this. Um, and that's kind of a lingering end. I like to leave things lingering. I probably would have done that if it was today. Well, that went for so much longer than I thought it would. I'm so sorry. Um, that is task A. Uh, my task B structure is different. And I suppose that people are going to want to know. So as much as this has gone on for long, um, I'm, I'm going to go through the task B um, to save me having to sit down and do another video another time. All right, let's get to it. Uh, I will just say that I wrote this uh, a, a year after I sat my GAMSAT. I'd done no practice in the interim. It's probably rough around the edges. Uh, it happens to be, I think, my favorite task B um, in spite of that. Um, but it might depart from, from a perfect structure. Let's we'll, see. Right, vulnerability. Oops. <clears throat> All right, hook. So I like to, um, my hooks are always, uh, uh, oh, I should probably color code like this, shouldn't I? What did I use for the hook, yellow? Uh, I, I don't know, I doubt, but if anyone's read Ulysses, yeah, it's a very stream of consciousness type book. Uh, I, I like to kind of start my task B's as if I'm midway through a sentence, kind of thrust them in. Um, you know, it seems almost like this should be written, you know, it was mid-paragraph mid rather than it was the first line. Um, kind of like if they walked in midway through a conversation. 
uh, it just has this sense of kind of thrusting them in before they expect it, before they know what's happening. And they're, oh, what's happening? What's happening? And it kind of, I don't know. I just, I, I think it entertains. Anyway, that, that's my hook. The longest time I thought vulnerability is, was weakness. <clears throat> the irony here is I'm being vulnerable in, in uh, I always try in my hooks for task B to be vulnerable in some way um, because it puts the marker's guard down. Uh, inclines them towards you. It makes them more likely to like you. I also think it's a high order mature thing to be able to look at yourself in not a critical light, but in a, to, I suppose, evaluate from maturity, your previous ideas or actions and, and, and see how they were less, they were less than perfect, which is in intrinsically humane or human rather, um, because <clears throat> humans make errors and humans aren't perfect and humans are always learning. Um, but humans generally also tend to always want to see themselves in a perfect light. And not doing that is something that is typical of people that have you know, undergone therapy and, and stuff like that. And, and I think that telegraphing that to a marker, if you have the ability to be reflective in that way, is, is, a, is a high scoring thing to do. So I start with something vulnerable, generally talking about myself in a way that is uh, less than perfect. And I think you'll see by the end of this paragraph, I uh, capitalize on that even further. Starve weakness, star weakness feed strength, I would say, covering up my nakedness, pretending it wasn't there. So this is not just getting, uh, this isn't just being flashy for attention. It's, it's uh, I, I suppose I'm, you know, I, I suppose I use nakedness because, you know, I use the word vulnerability. So I was trying to paint a picture of, of like, kind of like when a baby's born, the vulnerability and nakedness, rawness, um, you know, uncontrived by clothing and tattoos. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, and also the, you know, the fact that I'm covering up my nakedness, I'm covering, I'm, I don't want you to see me, you know, reflecting on myself in that way is very, it's, it's, it's vulnerable showing that I was unwilling to be vulnerable, pretending it wasn't there. I'm fooling myself. Uh, I, I, I used this phrase because I just, I guess, you know, it's just a bit of philosophy that I once learned and, uh, you know. I thought showing that I knew it as much as I've moved on from this point of view, you know, I mean, there was some substance to where I was coming from before as well. Um, <clears throat> so I became the fabric that covered me. Stitching haphazardly, hurriedly. Uh, I always, I generally use a bit of alliteration at the start. Notice here I'm entertaining. I'm just, I'm just getting you on side. I'm making you like me. I'm having a bit of fun. <laughs> I'm showing an ability to write creatively and figuratively. Uh, and also there's a psychometric uh, purpose to this as I said the willingness to be vulnerable is not just to get them on side but you know there's reflectiveness and self-awareness that that is um, you, I think you'll see that this essay wins its points not through logical um, critical reasoning like my prior one does I chose this to put next to the other one because it's completely different and this wins points by being strategic and diplomatic and very emotionally intelligent and reflective Stitching haphazardly, hurriedly. So there's a sense of momentum, of pace, of uh, not freneticness or urgency, but like there's, you're in the middle of something. I'm not slowly starting. I'm not lethargic. You're thrust in. Um, I wove stitch by stitch. Again, alliteration. And here, stitching, stitch by stitch, haphazardly, HH, SS. By the crochet of inauthenticity. I don't love that, but anyway. And told myself and others it was strength. This is good. I like this because... Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm admitting to a fault that I was inauthentic, was on, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm owning up to having lied to myself and others about it, but not in such a way that I deliberately lied. I have seen a couple of students uh, take note of and, and, and emulate this talking about yourself in a less than perfect light in their task Bs, but that they, they actually say bad stuff that they did. Don't <laughs> like you want to take something that's not that bad and possibly make it seem not be guilty about it, but you know, don't say that you like laughed when your brother died or that you manipulated your grandma or something like these are the things that like, um, a lot of people do it. I'm not just criticizing those that do that. I'm just saying that when you're fessing up to something, don't make it a big thing. Um, anyway, <clears throat> uh, but but that you were willing to do it though is that is psychometrically good because most people aren't willing to see themselves in a negative light. Most people don't reflect on their actions. And go, do you know what? I, I could have done that better. You know, this is where I was at at the time. This is where it was coming from. But I see now that you know, possibly I was missing this. That kind of narrative and deliberation is very high scoring. And that's why I'm doing it here. Told myself I was no longer skin and bone. 
Uh, kind of, I used a truncation here for cadence, told myself it's not going to skim down. I was, I told myself something more, something greater. Underneath, I bled, but nobody saw it. Again, I'm really hammering home here this vulnerability, really showing myself as not weak, but exposed and raw. I'm being very raw. I'm being very deliberately raw here, trying to connect with the humanity of the marker. But nobody saw it and I wove it over and over until I didn't either. It's kind of sad. Um, you know, I, I feel that this positions the marker as someone that's going to feel em empathetic or not sorry for me, but not protective over me, but just feel me, feel my humanity and my uh, soreness, ignorance, confusion, youthfulness, perhaps. Until I didn't know anymore myself, until I didn't know myself anymore. So, I mean, you know, I've used a semicolon here to split two um, phrases themselves, split by a comma. Obviously, they're inversions of each other. It's just, it just came up. That was, I suppose, a moment of inspiration. Um, <clears throat> sure. Uh, the, now, it's important. Notice here the change in tone. I've shifted gear. This is very uh, creative writing, stylistic, using various devices to kind of appeal, be raw, and kind of uh, emote uh, a picture uh, to the marker. But I've done it by here. If I keep doing it, it would become annoying and I would lose marks. So now I'm, I'm switching to uh, uh, more direct. I'm denoting now. I'm telling you exactly what happened. The partner had a miscarriage and emerged from the womb. I obviously use the word the womb of the bathroom because womb, miscarriage. Shaken and shocked alliteration through the thicket of the tapestry now wrapped around me. I reached through my calloused exterior and the best I could do was make her a tea, reach out and gingerly pat her head. Uh, I'm cringing reflecting back as I write. So I'm just using that to soften what I did. You know, uh, I, I, it's in my mind that it's possible that a marker it, that's reading this is a woman, probable that it's a woman, uh, probable that if they're a boomer, they uh, <clears throat> might have had a, might have kids, uh, not unlikely that they've had a miscarriage or that they know someone that has. So it's in my space as I'm writing this that I could be triggering a marker. And I really want to make the point that I know that that's not the best um, uh response to that particular thing but you know i'm telling you it for the purpose of dissecting something but i just don't want her to conflate me if it is a her to conflate me with uh possibly another i don't know faceless man that didn't deal with the situation properly because then it might not serve me when she's marking my essay um all right i watched myself as if from above disassociated from the situation helpless knowing it wasn't adequate knowing that <clears throat> what i thought was strength had in fact become weakness helpless knowing it wasn't adequate. So I'm saying that I know it wasn't adequate response. I'm softening it, knowing that what I thought was strength instead of alive, I showed up as heartless. Um, okay, so I'm showing uh, an awareness of my ability to see myself from the outside and reflect on how others might be perceiving me. That's a psychometric point, black and blue, a mess of fabric strung together this way and that by each hurtful thing I've guarded myself against, back into a quarter and unable to reach out to those who needed me until one day I woke up. Okay, look, that's, it's, it's going to be very hard for you to distill anything from that that you can go and apply uh, in terms of structure um, because it's loose. Uh, it's, and a narrative generally will be, by the way, it doesn't, there's no real structure to a narrative. It's, it's, it's the one opportunity. It's the, it's the most free and spontaneous you can be in Gamsat, which I know is going to appeal to some and not to others. Um, but <clears throat> I, I would say start, you know, I make, I hear that point about kind of starting as if you're midway through a sentence. I think that's good. I think using things like alliteration and various stylistic devices is good. I think emoting and speaking raw and vulnerable is good. I think owning up and being willing to see yourself in a less than perfect light, but not about something that's actually really bad uh, is a point that you can make. Uh, and the rest of that is just how I chose to deliver on it. All right. Um, let's have a look at now, one thing I want you to notice about um, my task Bs is the gear shifts. I change completely in style and tone uh, a lot. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see it's creative writing and, and even the, the more intense kind of um, prosaic and abstract types of creative writing, I, uh, I stop here and then start to 
I still do it a bit, but I'm being more deliberate here. Uh, I totally change. Now, the, this is important here. So this is narrative. I'm just going to color code this like I don't know, yellow, I guess, narrative. Generally, I keep the narrative short. This is longer than I normally would. 150 words is usually adequate. This would be 300 odd. Um, this, now the reason I, 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 in almost all of my essays, I wrote the significance of this narrative is in its telling commentary on, and I state my contention using the words of the prompt. I deliberately chose to say that another way here because I wrote this essay um, after I had started 90 plus and, and a lot of people were copying that exact phrase. And so I was trying to make a point that there's a function that's being filled here, not a direct uh, use of words that's high scoring. It's the function. And the reason, um, uh, let me just see what I've said, uh, a true story and another, an insight and an unguarded commentary on my own process of learning one small but significant dimension of vulnerability. Okay, so <clears throat> this is... Hmm. Let me articulate to you first the, the function rather than the formula. After your narrative, if, if, if it's done well, they will like you. The marker will like you. They'll be related to you. Their guard will be down. You'll have them on the side. The thing is, narrative is necessarily abstract. It connotates, which is to say it, it works through implication. You know, at the end of Harry Potter, you don't get something directly. Uh, Harry Potter, whatever book you read, I don't know, whatever, right? But you get a... You, you, what has been imparted to you is a sentiment. They've colored in a, a picture in time for you and you're left with something, but not in the same way as you're left with a non, in a nonfiction book where you actually have facts that you've taken away. Um, similarly, when you, when you tell things through story that, that you've imparted something to them, I've, I've shared a bit of myself with you such that you feel me, but you can't directly take something from that. Um, so the, the marker, what I'm getting at is they might be afraid that you don't know, uh, not that you don't know, but that you aren't going to directly deal with the prompt. Um, and they might have to imply something about you. And, and, and it's, it's kind of, it's introducing some ambiguity, uh, and a lack of clarity into, um, their ability to really see what it is that you want to say to them about the prompt and, and your awareness of the prompt. So I'm assuaging or I am dealing with that concern that the mark might have by going, don't worry. This is the reason I told you that um, narrative. I'm not going to just continue to tell you about my life. Um, we're gonna, this is going to be a focused essay. It's going to directly address the prompt. Um, and uh, the prompt in this case was about vulnerability. Where is it here? Um, okay. So it's about the weakness or strength of vulnerability and what it sounds like. Um, so <clears throat> I'm addressing that there's a story, it's a narrative. I'm telling you why I told you it. Um, one small but significant dimension of vulnerability. I suppose technically this sentence should be like this. And actually this is the first sentence. Each person I ask will have a unique and equally valid perspective on what it really looks like and its importance. So I suppose that the, um, the essential function is to link the story with a contention. My contention is that there are varied opinions on what vulnerability looks like. So I've, I've, I've linked this with now a, a point and that point is what we're going to you know, address in, the, um, in the, the subsequent essay. Um, so this, and, and it's, it's kind of hard because again, I'm, I'm departing a little bit um, because I, I kind of elaborate on my point here. So, I mean, this is kind of the content, this is a whole is the contention, but nevertheless, I'm just going to mark this as um, contention. No, oh, I forget my color coding system, but let's just use green. This, I don't know what to call this. This is kind of like a, a link or a segue, segue or, or, you know, significance of the narrative. It, it just fulfills those functions I said before. Um, you know, it stops them being concerned that you're just going to randomly go off track um, and, and it links a narrative to a, a denotative, which is to say explicitly said um, contention. So it, it focuses the essay. Now we've landed and, and we've got something to do and, and to explore. Now I make a point. <clears throat> so this is where this paragraph generally, body paragraph one of a task B is where I start to um, use the narrative to investigate um, the dimension of life that has been prompted to me by the prompt. 
I've been prompted to talk about vulnerability um, and on weakness and strength and how that all interrelates. And so the point that I want to make, the point that I have witnessed from my personal experience related to this narrative is that uh, vulnerability is uh, proportional to the essential quality of life. When it's gone, life becomes sterile and not very much like life at all, which is to say, if you're not vulnerable, you're not living. Vulnerability is the conduit of love and love is the essential quality of life as I see it. Um, fear, on the other hand, is its antithesis. Fear uh, is uh, you know, tension. or well, fear is the, the conduit for tension. Tension clutches on. Um, love lets go. When you let go, you can flow. Obviously, when you're clutched on, you can't. Um, so there seems to me, at least, to be this kind of interplay between fear and love in life. And, and that's what I want to get at, how I came to um, be aware of this. Uh, whenever I make a point, I always see this is a very absent. I want to make a point here, actually. This isn't, this is kind of like contention elaborated, elaborated. This is a, I, I, I almost never make an abstract point without giving a concrete example immediately after because it's balance. Um, so this, I'm aware coming out of that sentence that you probably don't know what I mean yet. So I need to start to ground you in something you can clutch on to and go, oh, okay, that. So I go into this. Uh, uh, Darsan being here, sure. How do you believe is an essential quality mood? Cool. All right, so this is an example of my point. Notice how this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I formulaically intended it to be this way. I just happened to be, but notice that this is kind of similar to it. The task A paragraph starting here. Kind of, this is kind of our contention, point, example, and here, evaluation. See, this is, a, this is a fact about the world. I just know that Heidegger said a thing. It doesn't teach you about me, except that you know now that I know a thing. That doesn't let you, though, as a marker, psychometrically assess me and see if I'd be a good doctor. This will, though, because now I start to evaluate the significance of this example and the point that I'm making in light of the thing. I had reduced my uh, da sign, my experience of being in each moment uh, as a coping mism to the most literal cerebral flavor of living, logic. So I'd become very analytical as a, uh, as a coping mechanism of uh, deep childhood trauma. Not entirely a weakness, but not entirely a strength. Somewhere in between where everything I did turned to gold except loving and I felt none of it either. I guess I'm trying to hint here at a bit more vulnerability. Um, but uh, I'm saying that, you know, that there was a benefit to being strictly analytical and unmoved by um, uh, the, the, the small emotional, but perhaps strictly speaking, irrational things that humans are moved by. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I like that word irrational because it has a negative connotation, but uh, strictly speaking, there are things that humans ordinarily worry about that uh, they often don't have, they, they shouldn't necessarily be worried about, you know, like, I don't know, maybe... <laughs> You know, I don't like the way I look today or, you know, I, uh, I'm worried that I won't make commission at the end of the month, you know, if you work in sales when you have every single month for two years, you know, these kind of just mind chatter that undermines you. Anyway, psychologist Freud and Jung talk of the unconscious and shadow. Um, yeah, so here I, I am just name dropping for the purpose of getting, cleaning up extra points, um, you know, I, I suppose the point that I next wanted to say was there was something frightening lurking in my unconscious that had this be the case. I, I'm getting at more of the coping mechanism, but to link myself to that point, I just thought I'd chuck in Freud and John to get some extra points. But really the point that I'm making is this, this is just, I don't know, dollar signs for extra points, really. Um, something so frightening lurked in mind that it seemed I couldn't bear to face it. So instead I sat in the ivory tower learning all I could to make myself stronger even in ivory towers, rent comes due. That was from a article from the Quadrant, I think. Just phrases that I jot down from articles and they, they find their ways into my essays. And it, 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 you know, it seems now you're like, oh, he's a good writer. No, I just copied someone. Uh, and eventually light hit the shadows and all that's all there was. As I've grown and matured, I came to see that reconciling our shadow and inspecting how our unconscious um, informs. So this is getting more to, again, evaluation. Um, here I'm explaining something that happened to me and, and, and starting to write uh, with reference and with vulnerability to um, 
epistemics, philosophy, history, psychology, um, writing it in as I go to, to just give more credibility to my writing. Um, okay, as I've grown and matured. So, so now I'm getting kind of back to the, the, the point. Um, as I've grown and matured, so I'm reflecting now. Um, I came to see that reconciling our shadow and inspecting our unconscious and forms of behaviors are essential in ensuring that we relate to others in healthy and socially productive ways. That is a very strong psychometric point. That shows maturity. It shows an awareness of the importance of interacting in healthy and socially productive ways. It shows an awareness of the fact that I need to do work on myself and look into my history um, to, in, in order to do that. It shows that many humans naturally probably won't do that um, due to previous experiences, whether they have acute trauma or not. Um, so this is really the goal. This is psychometric gold. And, and I would suggest to you that, um, that, that this paragraph, body paragraph one of the task B, it's all about emotional intelligence. You'll see in body paragraph two, it's going to be all about IQ. I'm just going to go straight, hardcore, surgical logic and, and, uh, and analysis. But here I'm being vulnerable. I'm showing emotional intelligence. I'm showing awareness, compassion, sensitivity, warmth to other people. Um, Okay. More importantly than our fear. Okay. So now this is an awareness of uh, the intrapersonal dimension to life and, and, and showing that I am well adjusted uh, as a person uh, to it and to other people's uh, internal worlds and, and how I implicate and impact other people. This is going to go more of a, a philosophic insight. So I'm, I'm reflecting, um, telegraphing as much emotional intelligence as I can, but get looking underneath. Um, so this is, I, I suspect, going to be an insight. Um, more importantly, that our fear, which keeps us from being vulnerable, so that there's that insight, um, showing that you, you can see the relationship between various uh, interpersonal things, uh, is the essential human limitation in that it is antithetical to vulnerability and therefore to love. So I'm showing that I am acutely aware of the relationship between fear, vulnerability, love. Um, yeah. And love, I believe, is the essential human strength. Now, there's two things I'm doing here. I'm, 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 I'm subtly inclining you to me um it's a very palatable and easily accepted and likable statement to say that uh, love is the essential human strength i'm sure there'll be some people that say it's naive but if you imagine the marker at night sitting there imagine the kind of person they'd be it's probably not a statement they expected to crop up in a gamsat essay I suspect that it's going to make them like me. So I'm kind of just being pragmatic in expressing myself in that way. Um, uh, I've come in. Uh, whatever baby steps felt safe at the time to step further into love. So, you know, I'm talking about feeling safe. I'm just, again, trying to be vulnerable. I'm aware that you probably like me. Uh, I suspect... I'm not sure why exact... Oh, my partner had a miscarriage. So it is implied for most people, that I'm a man. Um, I generally don't, by the way, telegraph gender or anything that can uh, help uh, a mark know who I am because I think it can uh, render biases, um, probably less. Um, let's not go there. Uh, but because I know that the marker thinks that I'm a man because I suspect that probably they're going to be a, a boomer and a woman, uh, they're probably going to assume that I'm younger than them because most people sitting in the games that would be in their early 20s. I just have a feeling that a person like that would like or it would be refreshing to a person like that to hear a younger man uh, be vulnerable, to talk about being safe and to have an aware an emotional intelligence and awareness of love. So I'm kind of just, what's that word? Um I, I can't think of the word, but squeezing as much juice out of the orange as I can by, by trying to be extra vulnerable, knowing that I've probably got them on side. Um, to step further into love, to strip myself of these tattered garments, to make myself naked and stand in the light of all this not so glory. More of the same. That's what I explained in the intro. My partner, I suppose. Okay, so I generally do this in my... So this is the conclusion of um, uh, the insight. Um, so I've given you some examples here, but... This, I suppose, you could really say is the evaluation. So this is where I'm giving you uh, the insight, insight that relates to the prompt. This is where I'm giving you, uh, I'll just color code that for you. This is where I'm giving the my insight that relates to the prompt. Um, 
and I'm trying to show that I can see or I'm aware of, of uh, dimensions of the world around me um, in such a way that that makes you see that I'm someone that's insightful because that's the essential thing being marked. I always choose narratives that have another person and I do that because at the end of my body paragraph one, uh, given that I've explained to you that this paragraph is all about emotional intelligence, I took that volume up here, uh, all about emotional intelligence, I think that it's emotionally intelligent to be able to consider things from other people's points of view. So my narratives always have another person and this is where I'm going to now consider things from another person's perspective. <laughs> with an awareness of my, the limitations of my ability to truly know how they feel. I'm just proposing how it seems to me that they might feel. My partner, notice, I suppose, absolutely key. If I had have just said my partner felt lonely, unassured and disoriented, even if that's what I observed, that would have been a, a big error, well, possibly a big error. Um, there is something possibly triggering to some women about a man telling them how they feel. Um, I say that because I happen to be a man writing this essay and it's clear from my introduction that, well, yes, clear um, in my introduction that, that I am a man uh, or <laughs> I'm getting myself in hot water here. A penis haver. Um, <laughs> and um, I suppose people in general uh, don't want others to, to assume that you know how they feel because that's not, empathy being with someone strictly is, is empathy um and considering how they feel is empathetic uh the short of it is i got pulled up by a friend who happens to be a woman uh on a part of my essay that i had asked her to mark uh wherein i said uh, you know my partner felt blah 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 and it just really didn't sit with her well and she said it and i didn't agree and i kind of sat with it for a few weeks and, and i ended up realizing that it, it, it works well to show an awareness of the limits of your ability to truly empathize given that i'm not a woman i, I can't know how she feels i can't know how it feels to have a miscarriage it's never happened to me um, so there is a necessary limitation there and that limitation necessitates me proactively being sympathetic if i wish to remain connected to her okay uh at a minimum confused and distressed and was unable to rely on me at that time for support cool so awareness of another person um so considering from another person's point and doing this reminds me of how like much internal structure there is and things that I, I'd kind of forgotten that I do um, in these essays. Not being female or her or formally pregnant, there are necessarily limits to my ability to truly empathize with her. So note, I don't just say there are limits to my, as some people have copied in my essays or from my essays, I don't just say there are limits to my ability to empathize. I'm, I'm showing why there are limits, you know, limit uh, awareness, of limitation because it is emotionally intelligent to be aware of the fact that there are limitations. Most people are of ability to empathize. Most people just assume that they know how you feel based on your reaction. And it doesn't feel nice when someone does that. It's not nice and you wanna be nice. And um, that's why I do this in this way. Um, I don't know why I didn't mark that. There you go, red, sure. Uh, I am cognizant, however, that the degree to which my empathy is limited is the degree to which my sympathy is necessitated if I wish to remain connected to her and her dar sign. Um, I probably didn't need to put this in. I don't think that was a very well executed. I was just trying to clean up an extra mark, but without context to what dar sign is, um, that, that's actually a bit weird. And I, I think this is an example, of, not a good example to have done that there. I should probably get rid of that. Um, I suppose I did say all lived experience. Note that I didn't just drop dar sign. I did say lived experience. What, what actually, what this should have been is I should have gone her um, and her dar sign and what existential existentialist philosopher Martin. Oh no, because I said uh, dar sign earlier on the essay, didn't I? That's why. Yes, sorry, I already said it earlier in the essay. That's why I did that. Ignore me. Um, sure. So I'm just thinking back. Uh, aware that to feel for her beyond psychologically, I must feel for myself, scary as that is. And that takes courage, but it is important work. We may never know or be able to know truth with a capital T. To me, however, truth. Um, so yeah, an awareness of that, even though these are my conclusions about vulnerability, that doesn't mean that they are true with, an app, with a capital T. Um, they are relatively true in my experience, um, but not absolutely true. 
To me, however, truth is not dissimilar from love. And if I'm not vulnerable, then I'm blind to what is true and deaf and dumb to engage with it in another. Just further in, a self-awareness and insight. Um, I'm doing it because it's unusual. I'm well aware that it's unusual that people have this degree of insight. Uh, sorry, not insight, sorry, self-awareness. I happen to be hyper self-aware to a fault, um, but I'm doing it deliberately to be different. I want this to be unlike any essay they've ever read. And you have your own qualities that, you know, so lean into what it is that you do that's unique. When others zig, you zag. Yeah. All right. So that, the, all those things I did there were set up to show the maximum amount of emotional intelligence that I possibly could. Um, all right. Let's go into paragraph two. Notice here what is coming, a complete gear shift. You'll notice it. Well, I hope you'll notice it. We'll see. Um, in tone. Uh, um, actually, perhaps not as much as I... Okay, well, I think my other task B is I, I am much more directly... You, you, I call it schizophrenic because it's just like complete change from emotional intelligence to just strict... Um, logical analysis of the topic. Uh, I think the reason why it's happened here is because, again, I'm trying not to use the word that I, I always have the exact same phrase at the start of my paragraph two, but people were copying my essays a lot. So I was trying to make a point. When I posted this, I was deliberately making a point to people that it was the function that needs to be fulfilled, not just use Michael's words. Um, the, the phrase as it originally stood was, um, uh, as I look farther afield uh, in contemporary society, or I'd say history, philosophy, psychology, whatever the point I was going to make, um, uh, as I look farther afield in contemporary history, uh, I see uh, some important corollaries between, and then I'll restate the insight from my paragraph one. Um, so in this case, the importance of vulnerability. Um, and um, then I'd say where I see the corollary. So for example, it might be, uh, as I look farther afield in contemporary society, I see some important corollaries between the importance of vulnerability intrapersonally and um, the lack of vulnerability on the world stage between some of the world's biggest political leaders causing destructive outcomes. For example, between Rocket Man and Agent Orange, a la Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. And so then I'll go and say, and, and the, the, the point of this is to go, okay, I've now previously witnessed um, something about the world intrapersonally. And I want to see if this thing applies interpersonally. Um, so that's what we do. And here I'm just doing this in a different way. I surveil the way around me and look to see if this confrontation with fear in pursuit of love and the importance of vulnerability to this process. So notice that this is just restatement of insight from P1. Um, might be unfolding out there as well. Indeed, it seems so. It looks to me that some of humanity's most addictive dispositions arise out of deep-seated discomfort with interrogating that which makes us feel that we need to cover up and an inability or unwillingness to be naked. So I'm saying that basically things out there um, that are addictive arise due to our unwillingness to be vulnerable and deal with our stuff, basically. Shopping, eating, drinking, drug use, working, willingly conscripting ourselves into neurological slavery to our smart devices. That was a phrase from the minefield all seem to be various fonts of not diapering the energy. I, um, of maybe I did deliberately do that. No, I did. I misspelled something once in an essay <laughs> and accidentally wrote diapering, but then realized that it works. So I think I was repeating it. Yeah. Um, I like to use words in funny ways, fonts, diapering. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> So this is the point. And this, by the way, just so you know, this is going to be, I, I'm going to move through this more quickly because this is just going to be a, a classic task, a body paragraph, um, except that it, it begins by connecting. Um, I suppose it's still a topic sentence. The, the point that I'm going to make, uh, I'm just, I suppose I connect, I segue from my insight to the rest of the world at, at the beginning. Um, so I suppose here you could say uh, is a topic sentence. Let's call this, why don't we call this segue? Oh, well, wow. no, I'll just leave that there, right? Um, this is a topic sentence. I'm just doing random colors at this stage. I don't even know what's what. This is an example.
This is an evaluation. Have we traded our social agreement with the world outside of the screen of convenience only having to have a discussion with a friend about product and simply waiting for Google? That's me just being facetious. Um, it seems much like it's no technology, blah, blah, conscious limitation, which is to say willingness to sit in the room of four walls, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is more evaluation. I just want to say, and by the way, it's, you know it's evaluation because it's stuff that's coming from me that I couldn't have got from elsewhere. I'm wondering, I'm deliberating on the world around us, but I'm deliberating specific to the nuance of the prompts and the top, topic at hand. So you know it's happening on the fly. I didn't just pre-prepare it. That's what characterizes a good evaluation. This might seem to you like I'm giving an example. I'm not, I'm just name dropping. Um, you know, I, I, I started writing vulnerability begets love, playfulness, and characteristic humanity. Then, when I said the word humanity, the word uh, the the um, in my mind just came Mandela uh, and Martin Luther King. And so then I just like chuck it in, whatever. So I started writing Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, and I was thinking of black people. Um, <laughs> and is Gil Scott? I really hope Gil Scott Heron's black. No, he is Gil Scott Heron's black. Um, uh, uh, oh. This wasn't executed terribly well, but Gil Scott Heron wrote a, was it a poem? Um, was it a song? Anyway, it, it, it had uh, the phrase whiteys on the moon and he was kind of contrasting how the white man was on the moon while the black man had no, you know, it was in the, in the fields basically. Um, and there was kind of a corollary between these guys and, and, and saying that these guys had warmth and humanity even though they knew conscious limitation, which is to say being put in prison um, and... I believe there was an assassination attempt on this man here. Um, they, they, they had characteristic humanity and warmth despite the, the difficulties they went through. Um, and while they're in prison, Whitey was on the moon. Probably could have been done better. But I just think that naming people helps. Shows an awareness that you know what's happening in the world and you talk with reference to other people and it kind of just gives a bit of depth and richness to your writing. I also like to use this because... Again, I'm supposing that a, that a Mark is going to be an older person and an older person is much more likely to know Gil Scott Heron. And if they do, they would appreciate your having used that example. It would be very unusual for that example to come up in a Gamsat essay because most people are going to be in their early 20s. So there'll be a bit of resonance there and they'll be like, oh, I get you. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like we're on the same page. <laughs> Therein lay the grand metaphysical significance of the COVID pandemic. Uh, life often demands. It's just more evaluation. Um, life of demands increasingly drastic increments what is required from us when we don't listen we are forced work too hard do not rest eventually you get sick and be put to bed to rest this is the great balance of life temporary unbridled neoliberal capitalism one of the most unbalanced political sure okay so here <clears throat> this is a continuation of my point but I, I suppose if you don't know you would see these as more examples but note that this Actually, so it starts here, grand metaphysical significance of the COVID pandemic, I believe. So what I'm saying is that there is some kind of, not if you don't know what the word metaphysical is, uh, like kind of spiritual or, or the, not divine, but there's some greater philosophic you know, significance of COVID, like a meaning. I suppose there's a meaning as to why it happened to humanity, possibly. Um, I start this point here and I actually continue it here. The grand metaphysical significance of the COVID pandemic is it forced us to stop. This here is just, I'm just cleaning up points. You know, I, I need to, I, in order to, to articulate the significance of that we did stop, I need to explain what it was that we were stopping, which is contemporary unbridled neoliberal capitalism. Unbridled is a good word to put for neoliberal capitalism, by the way. Um, And so I said, you know, and, and then I wrote this because that was what COVID stopped. This overproduction, insane ways of being and detrimenting the environment and ecocides that was happening as a result of unbridled neoliberal capitalism. As I wrote that, though, I wrote one of the most unbalanced political economic philosophies and dogmas of all time. This is an example of where I'm careful to qualify myself. I don't want them to be like, oh, what about Nazism? You know, so I was like, all right, fine. Barring fundamentalist terrorism. And I was like, okay, what else? Nazism. And then and other ra radical eugenic philosophies. Nazism is just a radical eugenic philosophy. I'm just showing an awareness of what it is rather than just stating it. And various branches of fas fascism. So I'd got to terrorism. I was with Nazism. I was like, bugger, I'll just chuck in fascism. And then once I chuck in fascism, I'm like, well, 
we may as well just chuck in the word Mussolini because I know that he was a fascist and it just shows that I'm aware that Mussolini was a fascist and that he was a prime minister. And so notice how I started here and I just kind of kept oh, this and this and this and I'm kind of just adding in detail as I go in. It might seem to you not knowing that I'm these, this is some formula. It's not. A lot of this might be confusing or, or look less formulaic to you because I keep threading in a lot of additional detail to show that I know exactly what I'm talking about. Kind of just things along the way embellishments here or there you know but really the actual point formulaically is there i'm evaluating coming to conclusions about the world and all this was just a point getting um sit in a room confront itself to give an opportunity for it to come to greater balance have we become more vulnerable with this blah 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 okay so pretty much all this is evaluation um evaluation Um, I usually don't ask rhetorical questions. I happen to have here, sure. Now, this so this is a link, um, but it links back to this because I have a kind of at the start of this, you know, and I don't in a task A, but in a task B, body paragraph two is very task A ish, and then it's like point, example, evaluate, link. Uh, at the start, you know, I began the paragraph with wondering, I wonder if this thing that I've talked about body paragraph one exists on a, on a grander scale. Let's have a look. And then I go, well, actually, you know, it does seem that it does. You know, I see this about the iPhones. I see this about COVID. I see this about this. And, you know, and then so at the end, I'm like, hmm, seems that there is a link. Seems that this thing about vulnerability that I've observed in myself isn't just in myself. It's, it's at a larger scale as well out there in society. And so, so this then is the link. All right, and then lastly, conclusion. My task B conclusions aren't very formulaic. It's kind of like the introduction. I know that's it's a little bit loosey-goosey, but I've come a long way. I'd like to think from pat on the head, uh, referring to having pat my partner on the head when they had a miscarriage. I always like to think of myself and others doing the best we can with what we've got. We're all limited, however, in the various ways by life situations, experiences, traumas, beliefs, sure. Um, The start of my conclusions is always, yeah, it's, I can't give a formula here. I'm, I'm kind of just summarizing the point or talking more kind of, you know, considering this and this, I'm, I'm com just commenting further, really. Um, and then this is where we begin, um, similar to what I did in the task A, saying that, there, you know, there are in, bound to be multiple perceptions. Um, this is kind of, at the start of my conclusion, I, you know, I consider all the points that I've made and come to some kind of conclusion about them. Um, after which I go, but you know, of course, this is just one version. There are others. Um, in this case, I happen to link in vulnerability again um, and saying that um, we don't need to agree. Normally, I would just say we need not agree, but because seeing as I'm in a vulnerability essay, I go, well, part of vulnerability is not needing to agree, you know, and accepting the variance. Um, this just was a moment of inspiration because it, it related to this. We need not agree. So this is where we go into the bit here about, like I said, you know, you said we, we won't always agree. And I look to see well, how might people with different ideas come together and what might the overlap where we can all agree, where I can then make a suggestion based on that for, for us all to move forward. We need to agree about the specifics of vulnerability, but we are but we are sure to be able to learn from one another while standing proudly in our very perfect, very unsightly imperfections. You know, so regardless of where you're at, what you think, we can all learn from each other. So there's something that unites us all here. I'm just addressing here the very unsightly imperfections. Uh, in a relative sense, it feels right to me to observe that we are in fact perfect and that it's all a matter of perspective. I think we both feel nice when we in when we are open in a place that it's safe to be. So now this start, this marks the beginning of the the closure. Um, closure. This is the um, united. Um, recommendation change and this is the closure i'm out of colors man um i think we both feel nice when we're open in places safe to be and when we acknowledge for the uh, preciousness the child within us rejoices at being seen and loved whoever you are i love you i think this is a little closer to the truth of vulnerability than where i started and for now that's enough so here i just start wrapping things up 
I wasn't really contrived or trying to do anything particularly here. I was just writing. It just came out. Um, but this note, though, um, it's a circular close. So I'm addressing where I started and saying this is where I got to. So where I started it gingerly patting ahead because that was the best I could do in response to a miscarriage. And now you're, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm recognized as a child within that needs to be vulnerable, needs to be safe. I tell you I love you. And for now, that's enough. And that's that. that. You know, there's a silence afterwards that just lingers and you, you can feel the closure. That's it. That was, I don't know how long that was. I'm so sorry for how long that went, but I hope that um, clarifies for you guys the internal structure and the reasons for doing the things that I did in those essays. Um, and I'm, I'm going to focus from now on on uh, less on articulating the theory. I think that's done. And as I said, focus on thinking of various ways to help you guys um, apply, make sense of, um, but, but more practical applied. Uh, stuff. I don't think the writing was necessarily uh, impractical before, but uh, I'm going to really make a focus on various ways that, that might help people who learn in different ways um, benefit from this knowledge. So if you have an idea about that, then please let me know. This came about as an idea and a request from a student, and I'm happy to oblige if it's going to help you guys out. Um, uh, that's it from me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you do want to understand any of that more deeply, um, there's plenty of information and blogs at the website, 90plusgumsat.com. Um, you can book a time with me so we can go over your essays if you wish. Um, there are books which articulate this in, in its purity. Um, so if you're someone that likes to study alone, you can go and do that. Uh, otherwise, as always, feel free to participate in the Section 2 sorted group um, where um, I can give you feedback on your own essays. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much, guys. I hope that was helpful.